talk about them you know, in the diary as well, because he's meeting with these individuals, and of course Malcolm was very, very meticulous. I mean, he took copious notes. Let me give you a little background in terms of how I gained access to the diary. The, um, after Betty's death, you have to understand both Malcolm and Betty died in test state. They did not have a chance to leave behind a diary. And consequently, that's why the estate is in such terrible situation today. It hasn't been managed well at all. Uh, it was left with the care of the daughters, two in particular, uh, Ilyasa Elshavaz in Malak, one of the twins. And one of the other daughters, hi, one of the other daughters, Malika, I put all the stuff in storage after the death of Betty uh, down in Florida, and the bill lapsed. And you know when you put stuff in storage and you don't pay, <laughs> that, I mean, it's gone, and people auctioned it off. A man named James Calhoun, he bought it. It's like, like you buy stuff like a pig in the poke. You don't know exactly what said it. They give you just a just an inch of information. I saw it happen with the property of Sugar Ray Robinson when I was working with his uh, son on the on the book Pound for Pound. And what can happen when you put your stuff in storage? <laughs> just like a care more on the set. All right. So so anyway, it, it, the labs, the boom. Somebody had to, uh, the stuff was auctioned off. It went to. Butterfield and Butterfields is one of the largest auction houses in, in this country. And Butterfield and Butterfield ended up, you know, with the stuff. Because when James Calhoun, when he got home, Lenny, when he got home and opened it, his crates up, he said, whoa, I got a treasure trove here. And so that's when he got in touch, you know, with Butterfields. And the stuff was put up on eBay. And when you put stuff, David, you know, when you put it up on, uh, on lots, you do it up in lots. So somebody brought it to my attention. So I went and saw the stuff that was being auctioned off. I said, my goodness. So Joseph Fleming, the late Joe Fleming, who was representing the daughters at that time, he's dead now. We got in touch with him. He brought a court injunction to block that auction. It was successful. All of that stuff reverted back to the family. So they had, this is going, we're going back to 2003, 2004 now, when a lot of this is happening. And so once the stuff came back to the family, two big, huge crates was delivered to the Schomburg Center. This is, Schomburg Center is one of the largest repository and archives that we have in this country. So the family had a press conference that said a 75-year agreement was signed between the family and Schomburg to keep that stuff there, to preserve it, to catalog it, to, to laminate and what have you, and make it available for scholars. Well, that process took five years. But all the while, you know, uh, no one had opened up these boxes yet. And this was Howard Dotson at that time, who's now at New Orleans Spin Garden down at Howard University, where he does a similar kind of thing in terms of uh, overseeing all of this very, very valuable uh, repository, memorabilia and everything. He called me up. You know, for about 30 years, I've been writing for the Amsterdam News. So he called me up. He says, Herb, we're going to open up these crates, and you can bring a, a photographer with you. And I brought James Gilbert, we used to call him the Iron Hand, but he's gone now too. And James and I went over and they opened up the crates. That's when I saw the diary for the first time. And I said, hmm, one of these days I'm gonna get to that, I'm gonna read that diary. And it took five years before the stuff was made available to scholars. And one of the first to do it, the man I mentioned to you early, Manny Marable. Not so much that Manning did it himself. He sent one of his research assistants over there, right? Uh, but they had only two purposes in mind. And you go back to the original proposal that doc, Dr. Mirable did, because he got a huge advance. You know, for a black writer to get a sub substantial advance, you know, from a major publisher, well, it ain't easy. 
<laughs> you, know, you know, you ain't Tom Clancy and John Gresham, you know. <laughs> but he got a big six-figure advance. So he had convinced them that he was going to deliver the goods. Well, we heard later on at least three of the things in that proposal. One, that he was going to out Malcolm. You know what we mean, out somebody, huh? That he was going to show that he was, he had, he was a homosexual. Secondly, that he had created all these infidelities, that he had cheated on his wife. Thirdly, that he's going to deliver the three missing chapters that was not a part of the autobiography. Now, those three missing chapters, just, uh, just the other day, I was over in a uh, court town and uh, visiting with uh, attorney Gregory Reed. Gregory has those three missing chapters. Gregory has the original manuscript. He got it all because the whole Alex Haley's, the estate, bellied up. They had to sell off everything in order to compensate for the damage he had incurred in doing the book Roots. You know, they dropped a tremendous thing on him. And I mean, uh, one of the first was Margaret, Margaret Walker, Alexander was the first to file a suit. Nefertiti, remember her book, Jubilee? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that was the first one to kind of raise some questions, you know, about the authenticity of Ellis Haley's research. But Harold Kurlander in The African, he dropped one too. And he got paid off quite handsomely. So much so it devastated, you know, the Haley family. I think it was something, um, $675,000 lawsuit. They settled out of court, so we're not sure exactly what that figure was. But it was a high number, so much so that it devastated, you know, the whole Haley estate. So they had to auction off stuff. They had to kind of be able to so that's when Gregory Reed went down to Henning, Tennessee. The money that had been given to him ostensibly by Anita Baker <coughs> to go and buy $125,000 worth of property from the Haley estate. That's what he has in his possession right now. I know when Manning Mirabel was working on this book, he, he came to Detroit to meet with you know Gregory about seeing those three missing chapters, and that's all he did. He opened the briefcase up, you saw it, and that was it. And it was kind of like such a terrible thing to invite somebody all the way to town and <laughs> with the understanding they get a chance to see the missing chapters, and now you open up your briefcase and close it right up. But whether that's true or not, it's one of those apocryphal things that are said out there about these incidents. But nonetheless, Gregory Reed has that property in his possession. and. Um, so when, they, so when they opened the crates up, and I saw that diary, I said, one of these days I'll get to it. And I finally did, you know, after two or three other scholars had gone in there and picked out what they wanted. Or they didn't find what they were looking for, so they just discarded it. There was no use for them. They didn't find the fact that, hey, he was a homosexual. They didn't find the fact that he had been, you know, cheating on his wife, that he had been uh, the beloved infidel. No. None of that was true. None of that occurs in the diary, in fact. So they just said they didn't have any more use for it. But it was useful for me because one of the things, this is Malcolm speaking without any kind of editorial interference. And if you read through, no one had read the, the, the diary in its fullness. And certainly no one had moved to transcribe it. And that took me a while you know, to go through it, but before I did any of that, I got in touch with one of the daughters, and I thought that she would be the most reliable one since she was considered one of the co-executives of the estate. And as a proviso, when you go into the microfilms at the Schomburg, there's a proviso, a warning up there, that you cannot duplicate, you cannot reproduce any of the stuff without permission from the estate. Mm -hmm. So that's when I took it to Ilyasa, and I told her, hey, what, what about this? She was a bit reluctant at first, but finally, when I told her that Hakim Adabuti would probably be the person we could take it to because we'd already done by any means necessary. So the track record had been established. The integrity was in place. 
So she, she finally agreed. We went forward with it, although again, she had some reluctance on where her sisters would be. And therein lies the rub that has stalled this project since last November of getting this diary out because it went into litigation. Uh, two sisters and maybe three decided that no, they didn't want this book to come out. Uh, <clears throat> so they dropped the uh, lawsuit. We went into court and it took us these many days and months, you know, to finally get a situation where we have an agreement and, and, and the verbal agreement exists. The signed agreement is still kind of hanging out there in limbo. But for the most part, since it was, you know, the court lifted the injunction and vacated it with prejudice. With prejudice, that means that ah, it can't go back in to court anymore. And even if it did, it would cost them a pretty penny and a lot of time. So anyway, what we're saying, gang, is that the book you're holding could be a collector's item. <laughs> Hang on to it, because heaven only knows what happens, you know, in further litigation is not out of the question, but we feel it will not happen. And one of the things, you know, that occurs so often, uh, I was reading the, in the day's paper where Bobby Womack uh, died, and he was, he was really, he was really upset that one of his songs had been stolen, you know, by the Rolling Stones, and made all that money out there. And he said, I'm going to drop a lawsuit on them. They sent him a check. It was all over. <laughs> he saw that check. <laughs> it's a whole nother game, you know. Forget about it. In fact, from that one song, it's all over now, it's all over now, boom. He got royalties that sustained him right through all the years. So, so sometimes, you know, you put it out there, heaven only knows what the diary will do in terms of sales. But, you know, I see you, Terrell. So what happened was is that um, when the book came out, the notification that was going to appear last November, it went to number one on C-SPAN, threw it on their bestseller list right away. Barnes & Noble, it was in all the stores. It was getting ready to rock there. Amazon.com, it is shot to four figures there. So it was looking good. And so now that the book is back out there, in fact, this is the first real. And I talked to Haki about it because we were concerned about, you know, the publicity getting out there, whether or not the, the daughters would get all upset all over again. He said, no, we're going with this here event. So this is the first time that we're offering the diary, you know, beyond what we did in Indi Indiegogo where we raised something like 18,000. That's what you call a crowdfunding method of raising money. We raised something like $18,000 there. Uh, so those people have now, be they have begun to receive their books. But uh, this is the first public assembly in which we can talk in a very realistic way about the flow of the diary. And you, you, I think it, it complements the autobiography in so many interesting ways. One, I'll give you one revelation from the diary. There are several. But one for me is that I think we have nailed who the CIA agent was who was shadowing Malcolm in North Africa in the Middle East in 1964. Now, Danny, we know. Mm -hmm. We gotta use the mic. Excuse me. We gotta use the mic. We gotta use the mic. They can't hear you. Buddy. Okay. <laughs> anyway, me and Mr. Mike. Is that okay? Yeah. That's okay. Good. Let me start all over again. <laughs>